Hello, this week we're going to be looking at open courses and content. Open courses and content is quite a controversial topic because there's many sides to that coin. Some people see open courses as the beginning to democratize education, where education is being opened up to the masses and a new era of access to educational content is arising. However, others simply see it as a trough of disillusionment and it isn't able to live up to all the hype people have been talking and spouting about it. This week, we're going to be analyzing open courses and content and the controversial issues surrounding them. The questions this week have been divided into three core themes. Question one will delve into the theme around the challenges involving open courses and content. Question two will focus on the theme of the future of education and what open courses and content mean for K-12 education, as well as graduate and undergraduate level education. And finally, question three will focus around the concept of if open courses and content is actually as revolutionary as some people claim. But first, if you continue watching, we'll do a quick review of open courses and content and how it all got started. According to Wiley and Gorel, the idea of round open content and open courses first began with open source software. Around the 1997, the idea of free software was beginning to come, become popular. However, some were still hesitant with the concept of giving something away for free. However, Wiley and Gorel identified the practical benefits around open source software which were the openness in the, on, in the software increases the software's quality, it also increases its security, and by allowing others to contribute free features to the software product, it makes the product better at a fraction of the cost it would take for you to manufacture or create it. With open source software, we soon saw the transition to open content, where people were able to access information on the internet. For free. One of the most well-known sites for open content today is Wikipedia. The founder, w Jimmy Wales, is quoted for saying in his 2004 interview on his own Wikipedia site, imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. That's what we're doing. Jimmy Wales and his partner, Larry Sanger, began to construct the concept that led to Wikipedia at the beginning of the turn of the century. However, it is still disputed to this day whether Larry Sanger was involved in the actual creation of Wikipedia or not. In 2002, the Hewlett Foundation began exploring ways to improve education through increasing access to educational materials. As well, an official MIT open courseware site was launched in 2003 with over 500 courses. Similar to open source software, there was those who weren't too sure about the open courseware sites because of the intellectual property issues and potential loss of revenue for these institutions. Up until 2008, anyone was allowed to view the lectures anywhere and anytime. However, they were not able to participate. And then, Two professors in Manitoba decided to open up their online course and massive open online courses, or MOOCs, were born. MOOCs are now hugely popular and many famous ones such as Coursera, Udacity, and edX are associated with very influential institutions. For example, Coursera was the brainchild of two Stanford University faculty members. And now, as we begin to look to the future, open source textbooks seem to be the new wave. With all of this open content, Creative Commons has come to solve the problem of licensing around them. Creative Commons states on their website that their mission is to help you share your knowledge and creativity with the world. Creative Commons develops, supports, and stewards legal and technical infrastructure that maximizes digital creativity, sharing, and innovation. Wiley and Gorel stated that in the first release of Creative Commons licenses in late 2002, it included three elective clauses. 
1. An option requiring attribution of the original author when reusing the material. 2. An author prohibiting commercial use of the material. And 3. An option, an option either prohibiting of the creation of any derivative works or allowing the creation of derivative works as long as these derivatives were relicensed under the same license. Now, on the Creative Commons website, you can see that there are six licenses about attribution, attribution share alike, attribution no derivatives, attribution non-commercial, attribution non-commercial share alike, attribution non-commercial, and non-derivative. So as you can see, they've become more developed and more advanced as time has progressed since they originally were released. However, Creative Commons has not solved all the problems with open content. There are still many critical issues around open content and specifically open courses, such as financing these courses, the quality of the content that's being published, as well as licensing disputes. Diana Larled also identifies specific myths surrounding massively open online courses. Certain myths she specifically states are that the content is free in education, that students can support each other, and massively open courses will solve the problem of expensive undergraduate education or education scarcity in emerging economies, as well as education is not a mass consumer industry. The question still remains, are open courses on content changing the way we view education and how to access knowledge? Is it making knowledge now a fundamental right for everyone on the planet? Or is it simply the newest fad that will fade out as quickly as bell-bottom jeans have gone?